Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Mark Moffat. He is a tropical biologist and research associate at the Smithsonian, and he used to be a visiting scholar in the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University, which he used to write the book we're going to talk about today, The Human Swarm, How Our Societies Arise, Thrive and Fall. So, Dr. Moffat, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, Ricardo, it's a pleasure to be here. Whoa. Or, Whoa. Or, or there. I don't know where I am now. It's so confusing nowadays, but a pleasure to be talking with you. Well, everywhere, I guess. This will be on the internet. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so j let's just start with a basic question. What is a society from a biological point of view? Well, a society, actually, I think from a biological point of view, is uh, similar to how we perceive societies elsewhere in our lives. Uh, the word society can be used in all kinds of ways. You know, it can be a, uh, a scientific society, it can be a, a social society and so forth. But what I mean by a society is a group uh, bigger than your, just your family, uh, where we feel a strong allegiance and we're often willing to fight for it and even die for it. And an important thing in this representation of a society is it lasts through the generations. And membership in it is involuntary. If you're born into a society, you're expected to die into a society, and your, your progeny uh, after that will be members of the society. So those are kind of attributes we think about for societies generally. Another important thing about societies is that they usually have a territory. So that distinguishes societies from things like the church, which take on certain kind of characteristics of the society. Various other things in life can have some of these characteristics as well. Uh, so we generally have territories. So we carve up, carve up the world into these different sections. Uh, there are people that are dispossessed that don't have societies like the Romani, you know, the gypsies. But those are the kind of things we're talking about. And uh, these societies uh, have been, if you look back at human life, uh, focal points for human existence throughout our history. Uh, so there are extreme cases of an in-group, uh, the, the idea of belonging, and uh, I would suggest that they're really ancient parts of the, the human mind, built into the human mind. Mm -hmm. So why is identity so important in animal societies? Well, uh, many people are focused on cooperation, mm -hmm. and cooperation is certainly an important component of most societies. You can imagine a society forming with rather minimal cooperation, as long as the members of that society are maybe getting uh, uh, sexual partners preferentially and so forth. But humans particularly have show a lot of cooperation. But what holds us together as a, a unit is this sense of identity, of belonging together, and uh, a lot of the book uh, goes into what that is, what it means. Um, we tend to uh, think about uh, uh, kinship and cooperation, I think, too much. They become natural fallback points in anthropology and sociology. But in fact, you know, you can have your worst enemy be a member of your society and you can be best friends with someone in another society. So our social networks, which is a big point of uh, discussion by a lot of people now, transcend societies that are different than societies. Um, so all these different kinds of uh, interactions, good and bad, occur across societies and between societies as well. So it makes them interesting to work out. But identities are what determine the society boundaries, who belongs and who doesn't, whether we like them or not. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's right to say that uh what distinguishes human societies from the societies of other animals and what explains our success is uh, large-scale, unusual levels of cooperation? Well, we certainly show uh, large-scale, uh, unusual amounts of cooperation. But as I say, you know, uh, we have to think in two different ways. We have to think about networks or uh, social networks and groups, and the society is a bounded group. So I think we need to consider societies as a bounded group and then look at how this large-scale cooperation occurs. 
and it may often transcend the society. Many of our cooperative networks today are across all these national borders. And so uh, uh, it's an oversimplification, uh, a very selective mode of thinking to describe societies as cooperative groups, which is sometimes do done. Uh, there are societies where it just seems totally dysfunctional, like in Venezuela, things just seem to be falling apart. But Venezuelans are intensely an, uh, patriotic people, despite all this dysfunction. So once you realize, uh, look at societies as bounded groups and try to consider uh, the levels of cooperation and dysfunction, I think you have a much more nuanced sense of how societies work. And we're talking about humans, but uh, I'm also interested in animals as well, of course. Mm -hmm. What is the importance of movements between groups? Uh, I mean, how does that change societies and drives and drive evolution? Well, across the animal kingdom, there's uh, there are examples of movements between societies, and that's often because uh, without that, we'd be highly inbred. I mean, so uh, anything from a chimpanzees, dolphins, all these species that live in these bounded groups that I'm talking about tend to have opportunities for new members to come into being. Once they transfer to a new society, they're part of that society usually for life. So it becomes essential uh, to their identities to join a society effectively and, and stay there. And that means being recognized by everybody is uh, no different essentially than individuals uh, that were born in that society in many cases. It gets more complicated for humans, but uh, the idea of uh, moving between societies is something that's gone back through our history. Uh, early humans, hunter-gatherers, often married between groups, and the person that would come to that group would be expected to fit in and, and become part of that society. Mm -hmm. So could you explain what happens specifically in you social insects? I mean, is there something special about uh, their societies? Well, you social insects generally have a, a, a kind of a, a stripped down society in a sense because their societies um, in the more simple forms are extended families, not just immediate families, but generations after generations. So there's a high degree of relatedness in those societies. They're usually sisterhoods. Um, however, some species that I'm really interested in, like the Argentine ant, have... Uh, many, many queens, that's the mother in the society, so they can grow very large societies, and they still seem to hang together really effectively, despite having societies in the hundreds of millions or more in some of these cases. So this kinship uh, uh, business is the root of the social and societies, social and insect societies, but it transforms in different ways, which are fascinating. Mm -hmm. Is there any single model of hunter-gatherer society we lived or evolved in? Uh, well, there are a couple of different models of them, and I would say that there's a continuum between them. Hunter-gatherers, first of all, are often talked about as if they lived in bands, and they did. They formed these little bands, usually 30, 40 individuals, uh, that work together. Uh, and, you know, hunted and, and slept together in one spot and so forth. But those were the equivalent of neighborhoods uh, today. So the bands, if you ask them who they were, would give a name for a group that was much bigger than the band and had a much broader territory. And people were spread out uh, across bands throughout this territory. They couldn't all come together in one spot uh, because the food was widespread. They'd have to spread out and hunt and gather. Uh, and so that's the classic hunter-gatherer society, which are these nomadic groups that nevertheless had a clear territory and a clear sense of identity. But in places where hunter-gatherers did have a lot of resources, for example, places like the salmon runs of the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. or parts of Australia, where there were eels that they could collect, uh, people could settle down in more permanent um, situations and live in villages. They were still hunter-gatherers because they didn't uh, have any domesticated foods, um, but their social structure would change according to whether they could live in this dispersed pattern or settle down. 
And I would argue that our minds are, are built to accommodate this wide range of possibilities and always have been. Early hunter-gatherers are always uh, per, uh, per, uh, shown as being spread out, but I would guess that as in hunter-gatherers today, if there were opportunities, they could form villages, settle down, and in that case, uh, have a different mode of life, one more familiar to us. Okay, so in terms of uh, their sociality, what would you say are the most distinct differences between the more nomadic hunter-gatherers and, on the other hand, the ones that tend to, uh, tended to settle more? Uh, the distinct differences, the commonalities included a sense of identity that uh, derived around all kinds of cultural cues and other kinds of cues. We tend to see each other as belonging because we have different ways of dressing and uh, speaking and all kinds of things like that. So those hunter-gatherer groups across those different styles of life shared that. But once you settle down, humans end up with some problems. One of the difficulties is that uh, when you're moving around freely, and you have someone around you you hate that's really bothering you, you can just get up and leave and go to the next band, the next campfire over. But if you're settled down, you're stuck with each other. And so uh, hunter-gatherers in settled situations like the other kinds of people today tend to develop uh, hierarchies and, and means of control, rules, and leaders. Uh, the people who spread out would put up with bleeders. You didn't have to. If someone told what you, you what to do, you'd just leave. Well, why would I listen to him? But once you settle down and there were disputes, you needed leaders. So the emergence of these hierarchies and leaders uh, started, I think, in the hunter-gatherer times, uh, I think probably very early in our evolution. They're more famous cases today, but they certainly came into being and fruition and flourished as societies get bigger and bigger and bigger and state societies and all these complex bureaucracies are outgrowths of this original hunter-gatherer settled lifestyle. Mm -hmm. What are some of the main advantages for humans to live in societies? Well, I, there are many kinds of advantages. Different animals have show different advantages to society life uh, and humans showed virtually all of them. You know, everything from working together to raise uh, offspring to common defense and so forth, all kinds of things in terms of, uh, in the case of more complex and bigger societies of humans, division of labor um, and hierarchies and all these other sorts of features I mentioned. Um, so, yeah. So, okay, so another question then, in terms of, scaling up societies from, for example, small-scale hunter-gatherer societies to modern la large-scale industrial societies. Um, were there specific steps that we have to take? Uh, well, not uh, necessarily specific. There were general trends. One of the uh, assumptions is as your societies get bigger, uh, you get more food, say, uh, you have agriculture, so you have much more food, is that societies can simply grow because there's more food. Uh, but that is really not the case. Uh, I give the example of what happens with monkeys that live in cities like in India. Uh, they have tons of food because they're around markets, uh, but their societies, their troops don't get any larger. They're just more troops packed together. So the really interesting question is, how societies, each society get bigger. You know, instead of the Nile Valley having this enormous empire, maybe there could have been uh, tons of different, you know, uh, Egyptian uh, groups there, small groups. So how do they get bigger? And uh, these have to do, I think, less with family relationships than many people like to think. Uh, Joe Heinrich, uh, his book is uh, The uh, Weirdest People in the World, emphasizes family relationships, but early hunter-gatherers actually didn't think about family relationships that much. They had these um, um, imagined families, you know, everybody could be your father or uncle and so forth. So this connected everyone up. And uh, right up to modern times, the sense of identity was the leading thing. And if you can keep that identity, that 
identity common intact among uh, uh, in larger and larger groups you have a chance to hold them together because what humans do is we use features as our identity love of a flag way people walk and talk all kinds of features we're basically walking billboards of our identity and so you don't have to know everybody many animals like a chimpanzee has to know everyone in its society to be comfortable it literally has to know everybody humans no longer need that so even hunter gatherers could have groups of up to a couple thousand where they didn't necessarily know everyone at the far end of the territorial range that are living over there but if they met them they'd instantly know that they belong together the sense of uh, sharing rituals language all these things were there and uh, but the hunter gatherers these they had no ways of bonding these societies together as they get larger and larger and larger they would just fall apart there were no um, things that helped later in a, as civilizations arose were things like highways and infrastructure that could connect people so they would know what was going on across greater differences so if differences emerged and rituals or way you dressed you found out about what people were doing over there and you become uh, comfortable with it uh, you'd have leaders that gave rules about how to behave so these kinds of features allowed societies to get bigger and bigger because since you don't need to know everyone someone can walk by you in new york many people can walk by you and you don't have to worry about them all because you're you have a sense of a common uh space with them in terms of identity and that's cultural things but all kinds of subtle things too it's really marvelous how the brain takes these uh features in very fast faster than the blink of an eye and you already know what's going on as you walk through a coffee shop say and see the people around you they're either part of your society or at least part of a society that you're comfortable with a visiting a uh, portuguese person perhaps yes uh, i think you ended up mentioning most of these just in our previous question but Uh, what are some of the most common markers of membership that allow for people to distinguish between in-groups and out-groups? Yeah, well, there's just a huge number. I talk about us having uh, uh, billboards. We are walking billboards for our identities. We, and as I say, this, these happen in a flash. It's amazing how fast people take each other's identities into our brains, faster than we're able to consciously recognize what we're doing. And what's really cool is they're not just these big things we think of national flags and anthems and things like that but they're all kinds of smaller things and they're things that we don't even know that are not in our conscious brains uh, for example there are studies showing that an american looking at someone in a distance can tell whether they're an american they don't they don't know they can do this and they're surprised when they get it right they can tell a fellow american by how they walk or wave their hand Uh, there are other studies uh, showing that if you have an Asian, uh, an Asian person with a uh, neutral expression, you can't really say anything about them. But if they smile, you can usually uh, tell accurately that they are an American. And we have these same emotions all over the world. Smiles are everywhere. But apparently different cultures have different ways of smiling, walking, all these subtle things. And so we are just immersed in the sea of these signals. Mm -hmm. What about things like ethnicity and race? I mean, do they have any sort of biological basis in terms of people using them to distinguishing between different human groups? Well, uh, ethnicities and races are, there are all kinds of things to go into here, uh, into those subjects, of course. Uh, they are both real and totally artificial. They're totally artificial in terms of the biology because uh races and uh, races particularly are a continuum uh all around the world there are different variations in skin color and everything else but it's also true that uh different human groups were moving around even in the deep past so a hundred thousand years ago 
uh, a, an African person walking along might meet someone that's remarkably different because their origin was farther north. The Bushmen, for example, are uh, the smaller people with a different kind of hairstyle than some of the Bantu and other people, but those groups had already moved around. So this sense of discontinuities were in our brains early on, and we learned to distinguish people in those categories, even if we had to push our luck with it because, of course, there are individuals that are midway between two skin tones. But we look, we take in those people's skin tones as long as they're, uh, along with their hairstyle, the way they dress and so forth, and we categorize them. We do not, we categorize them as if they were different species. So it's very hard. Uh, children will put people uh, put uh, animals into different categories there's no intermediates between lions tigers and bears and we do the same thing with people as if they were different species and uh, the fact is we ignore the discontinuities when we look at each other mm -hmm. what about the group as a whole how do people tend to think about groups do they also attribute an, ess an essence to them for example oh essences uh, so an essence is an elemental thing that makes something what it is. And that is something even a three-year-old uh, will look at an ethnic person and uh, see that person as belonging to a group that's natural, that's real. And as I said, those things, if you did the math on them and tried to work out, you know, if there's a, really a distinct group there, you find out maybe there isn't. But uh, the fact is, um, we find those essences and consider uh, people as if they were different species quite naturally. And it's part of the way we have to process the world. I mean, it's uh, both good and bad. One thing is the role of stereotypes. And a stereotype is something uh, that when you look at something, you're glancing around there, the world is full of things. So if you, if you scan around and you happen to be passing a chair, you take in the chair and you don't have to take in every characteristic of the chair. You just have looked at it for a, a tenth of a second and you know how to sit in and all kinds of things about the chair. You fill in all these details that you had no idea about from actually studying that chair because you can't stop and studying, study every object in the world. And we can't stop and study every person in the world. So what we do is we end up with these stereotypes which are socially shared, simplified predictions about other people. So a person that's a, a barista makes coffee will have all kinds of predictions about their job and what they do. Uh, a person that belongs to a particular ethnic group based on skin uh, tone, but also kinds of dress and language and so forth, we have all kinds of predictions about them. But of course, the difference there is a barista we don't see as having an essence. A barista isn't breeding other baristas into the future. Their coffee job is just something they're doing for the summer. But we view, because of this essence property, we view these ethnic groups and races as if they were permanent things. And uh, we that's fine to a large extent because people want to belong to these groups. A Mexican-American, for example, is proud of their culture and heritage and food and all these other things. The trick, of course, is when we combine those kinds of uh, knowledge about those persons and predictions about how they're going to behave with negative attributes about them. There are simplifications that ignore the individual differences, like, uh, uh, you know, a certain ethnic group is dangerous because it could be a terror, they could be terrorists and so forth. Those kinds of things are what makes life tricky. Mm -hmm. Do we tend to anthropomorphize societies as a whole, like, for example, attributing emotional states and goals to them? Yeah, well, we do. Uh, uh, that's called entitivity. Entitivity. Uh, and that's seeing a uh, society as an entity. And that's, uh, you know, um, and that's part self-inflicted. When we go in this country to a football game or some kind of, or if, we, or if we're watching the Olympics, we are like 
totally American about it. And we're united in our brains about being American. And if somebody wins a gold medal, it's as if I won it. This is like seeing yourself as part of this collective. But we still also see others as part of collectives too. So the trouble becomes there as you might see someone that's done a tremendous wrong that happens to be from another ethnic group or country, another society. And we assume everyone in that society is going to behave similarly, particularly when we're under stress and afraid, which is why, again, things like uh, terrorism can breed uh, opinions about whole nations, when in fact it's representing just a minority situation of a few people. Mm -hmm. Uh, can people in the same society change identity, uh, their identity over time, and how does that happen? Oh, identities are constantly in flux. You know, if you want to look at a different example of identities, there's the ant. And the ant uh, has a simple identity, but it works something like the human identity. Ants have a national flag. It's a scent on their body surface. And if you have that flag, you're golden. If you don't, you're likely to be killed or driven out. Um, and it, that doesn't change. They're stuck with that. There's no shifting. You're either part of that uh, ant nation or you're dead. Humans can shift their identities around. We have this possibility of, of changing who we think we are. We can do that within the society by, you know, becoming a goth and wearing black or you know, becoming a barista or whatever we want to do. But we can also shift our national identity over time. And sometimes we don't even know we're doing it. Uh, the American flag shifted from having 13 stars to eventually having 50 stars for 50 states. No one cared, but it was a, a different reflection of who we were. Our dress code, everything has changed over time, often very slowly. And uh, so if you went back in time and met George Washington in this country, he would think you were weird. He would not think you were American. You're just like really weird because you've changed all kinds of things. Being George Washington an American back then is different than now. So we like to think there's this, uh, that this extends through time in a permanent sort of way, but it's a constant shift in who we are. Do human societies go through a life cycle and what would that life cycle be? Uh, well, that's a, a good question and one that really interests me. Um, I, all societies seem to, in a, across the animal kingdom, seem to be ephemeral. They live and die over time. And so my hypothesis is there is a general life cycle, and the life cycle is determined by changes in identity. There can be other things that happen in America. You know, you can split North from South Korea because of some big political decision or some leader can go into, go nuts and cause a society to break down. But basically uh, the fact that it breaks down and, and uh, is usually and almost always around who people think they belong to. So I said the flag changes over time, a way of dressing and so forth, but say, a people on one end of your nation starts to behave a little differently and so forth, and it becomes more and more appalling to you, over time, these shifts in identity from place to place can cause societies to crack. And that was true back in hunter-gatherer times. These smaller band societies spread out over space. They didn't have newspapers or anything else, so they didn't know what the people were doing at the far end of their territory. And over time, everything would start changing and they'd meet them again after maybe being away for a year. And they're just like a little bit weird now. And after generations of that, and it took centuries, societies would split, even these hunter-gatherer societies. So these changes in identity from these identities, both keep us together and they break us apart. They keep us together when we share the commonalities. They start to break us apart when these common features start to vary from place to place in serious disruptive ways. Mm -hmm. But does this fracturing follow any trends? Uh, like, for example, does it follow ancient territorial lines or something like that? Well, 
the thing about modern societies and how we got the societies that are so large, nation states and nations and states, sorry, uh, is uh, not just from societies growing, but from taking in other societies aggressively. So the history of humanity has been one of conquest. Hunter-gatherers uh, did little conquest, particularly when you're spread out over space in these little bands. You couldn't even control anyone. You didn't have jails. You didn't have a way of controlling what they did. But once you settled down, you developed chiefdoms that could take over different parts of the territory around you and start to expand. And those people would become over generations part of your society and comfortable with being part of your society. At first, they would have you know, been mistreated and probably not happy about it. But uh, countries, all countries in the world have a history of this conquest. No country is a monolith, a uniform monolith. Even China, which seems so uniform because the, the, the people there uh, consider themselves one united ethnic group beyond certain small tribal groups here and there, smaller tribal groups. But across that country, there are all kinds of variations that reflect a deep history of conquest from generation to generation to generation. So uh, when things do break down in state societies, in these larger societies, it's almost invariably because of that. It's because uh, the people over in this end of the territory were originally part of a different society in the first place. So something like Yugoslavia fell apart basically along these ancient lines where people on one side had originally had their own society separated with their own territory, with their own national anthems, flags, and holidays, and they could return to all those and be comfortable with those and be happier with those than they were in this bigger uh, society where their identity didn't matter as much. So the trouble with large societies is you have these fractured identities potentially from place to place, which can make societies diverse and interesting, but also make people feel like they belong less uh, than maybe the ones in power where the government is. Mm -hmm. But looking back at uh, human evolution and human history, not just these more recent, let's say, nation state societies, uh, can we say that peace is common among human societies or is war more common? Well, it's been a history of uh, warfare and conquest. Uh, now, uh, these major uh, states have taken over the world, and there are umbrella bodies that can control, uh, to some degree, you know, there's always something in the news, uh, what's going on and reduce the prospects for war. Um, peace is a thing that humans do uniquely well. There are other species like the bonobos where different groups, communities of bonobos can get together. They can enter the territory of their neighbors and all groom each other and have a great day together. Same with dolphins. But most species do not get along well with their neighbors. And uh, the fact that we can do this is ex extraordinary. And it reflects perhaps the bonobo side of our background. There's a bonobo is the relative of the chimpanzee. So, uh, but... Even then, uh, a lot of the bonds we form often have to do with alliances between societies. And the trick is then the, the individuals like, you know, EU forms bonds, but then the people are, that aren't in the EU feel excluded and then there's tension there. So making a truly a global unity is, I think, pretty much impossible. We can navigate it. It's going to take a lot of energy all the time. Societies aren't going to go away. We need them for a sense of belonging and self-identity. And because they're ancient things, we feel this uh, pow power that they hold over us. So EU is a really important um, unit for Europe and uh, for economic reasons, but people's identity will be most sharply defined by, you know, being Portuguese and not part of the EU. Um, you might think otherwise, but uh, it's very likely that uh, uh, the societies that uh, make up the EU are they're quite varied. 
you know, there's some with communist backgrounds and some with uh, democratic backgrounds. They're, they have all kinds of differences. So the variety within them is going to be maintained. The societies are going to be, these nations are going to uh, stay put. Um, uh, and hopefully the things like the EU will continue to function. But to make the, something like the EU truly global is really difficult. Mm -hmm. I meandered what, across that question. I hope I answered it. Yeah. Uh, what are transfers of membership in societies? Well, transfers of membership in the traditional sense, and then most animals are single individuals. So a ch young chimpanzee female is, in most cases, obliged to leave her community and find the next community over. And she's foreign to them. But if she's a female in uh, heat, ready to have sex, usually the males don't mind, and she can convince her way to having the females accept her as well, and then she becomes permanently part of the society. But that's an individual moving. And in the past, that was true of hunter-gatherers too. Uh, someone would marry into another society, or maybe a society had been decimated and there were just a couple people that, that society, another society could take in. Uh, the really unique thing now is immigration and just the scale of immigration and what it means. Because immigration, which by which I mean um, the mass movements of a substantial population uh, that come in of their own volition, they make the choice to come, and we make the we allow them to stay and become citizens. This is really amazing stuff. And then the fact it works is extraordinary, but it comes with this baggage because uh, our history of expanding societies is based on aggression, which is based on dominance and importance. So a society that's bringing in immigrants is going to be the people that are going to be really uncomfortable if those people, those uh, immigrants come and take jobs, resources or anything else. You're, you're expected to come in, you're comfortable with people coming in if they're not taking anything from you. And uh, so these status differences remain with immigrate immigrants. And the immigrants can get around them in some cases by having particular jobs that they can do that the locals don't want to do. So uh, uh, in 1910, the Italians started moving into the States and they all many of them became barbers and it became acceptable to go to an Italian barber. So you had that kind of niche. But the problem we have in times of stress, which has included some of the recent years, is immigrants come and are seen as taking jobs and resources. And um, this kind of sense of uh, having uh, the dominant people controlling what happens doesn't go away. And those are the long-term residents of the society. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, transfers of membership, uh, things like slavery and subjugation of groups uh, also serve as that, right? As do what? Uh, transfers of membership. Serve, serve as, sorry. What was the question? Yeah, uh, I, I was asking if uh, slavery and subjugation of groups are other forms of transfers of membership. They can be. And this is the interesting thing, uh, because the most successful societies ended up creating over time, allowing those people in as members. And that's the process of assimilation. And so a slave in some North American Indian societies, people would be enslaved, but they would have a chance to become part of the Comanche tribe if they were successful in warfare and helped the Comanches in their battles. And then you become a full Comanche. So you had this chance of transforming and becoming Comanche. The, the thing is with all immigrants and all cases of subjugated peoples, uh, you have to have the opportunity to assimilate, to become like those people, but not too like those people. Because the dominant people, the people that have been resident there all the time, don't want immigrants to come in and be equal to them. They want a different class of people. And in a way, those people, immigrants and so forth, want that too in many cases because they are proud of their heritage. 
you know, as I said, Mexican Americans with all their food and everything else, and all these other groups that are here in the states, and those um, differences become important too. So you have to be. The trick is to become like the people living in the new society, but different from them, and the right balance. And this this being alike but different is the essence of how societies today work. And being a, allowing people to become like you is essential for having them become members of the society. So some societies would keep outsiders at a distance. Uh, the Incas uh, had a society where they conquered various groups, but they didn't allow those groups to dress or act or learn the language of the Inca. They were kept as outsiders. And it seemed like a very successful system when the Incas were discovered, but I would argue that that society was doomed to fall apart because unless they developed a commonality where everyone wants to be Incan, even if they can't be the same people that control the society and the, you know, the capital city, you, without that common belief and system, it's very hard to keep a society together very long. So we have to allow for people to come in and change and uh, become like us, but not too like us. Tricky stuff. Yeah. So talking about the life cycle of societies, how do societies end? Well, societies can end in, in various ways across the animal kingdom. Sometimes they just collapse and, um, and completely die. That's what happens with an ant colony when the queen dies. And other queens fly out and form other societies from scratch. That doesn't happen for humans. Despite what Jared Diamond says in the book Collapse and Other Things, human societies do not collapse in the sense of just completely falling to pieces. They break apart into smaller, simpler societies. So the Maya uh, and Aztec people had these giant uh, civilizations and then would fragment and then build up into giant civilizations again. It was never as if individual families would wander off in the woods because the whole society had fallen apart. So our societies fissure into pieces, usually in half, sometimes into more parts. And that's how our societies end. And then you can form societies in unusual ways. For example, when the uh, Aborigines first arrived in Australia, completely separated from all the peoples from their ancestors, and they could start a completely new kind of society from scratch. So immigration around the world in the earliest days, or migration, I should say, was a, a great creator of diversity in societies. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this is related somewhat to immigration, as was already referred in our conversation several times. Uh, when it comes to criteria people develop for citizenship, I mean, do these criteria follow along certain psychological predispositions we've evolved to re registering who is, who has a rightful place in our society, let's say? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question, because what I see as the problem in, in the nations of today is there's a disjunct a break between the legal status people gain, immigrants gain from becoming citizens, and how our minds treat them as members, how our brains register who belongs. Um, so you can, and, and that isn't even a matter of knowledge. Immigrants uh, coming to this country, the US, uh, will pass a naturalization exam, and they got to learn a lot more than native born people probably know. Most people in the US would fail this exam. So they have all this knowledge, but it's not knowledge that makes you a member of a society. It's a way of being, it's this deep tissue of identity. It's how you walk and talk. And so when you see someone uh, walking towards you along the street, you can also, you will sense that they're a bit foreign. They haven't been here for generations yet. And it does take generations for them to figure out how to smile, walk, and wave a hand, for example, like an American, let alone know all the details of the national flag and all these things that are kind of obvious to us. 
And uh, so that is a real trick because, you know, things can turn on a dime and when things are stressful and you have someone to blame, those that seem a bit foreign, even if they've been here for, even though they're the kids or grandkids of immigrants can seem a bit foreign, can, those people can be turned against and, and blamed for things. And it's hard to figure out how to manage that. It's all very good if the world was peaceful and the resources were abundant, but you know, times are difficult, jobs are short, uh, supply, and they're the easy, they're the cop out way to turn as a source of blame. Mm -hmm. So one last question or topic, what do you think about the idea that certain anthropologists and sociologists have uh, when they say that societies are entirely optional and that people only form such unions when it serves their interests. Yeah, well, we, we form all sorts of unions when it serves our interests. There are many, many forms of identity that human have, uh, humans have, both within and between societies, but societies themselves, as I emphasized at the beginning, seem to be ancient. They were probably there but before we diverged from the chimpanzees and bonobos because the bonobos chimpanzees and humans all have societies so uh the role, rule of parsimony would suggest uh the simplest hypothesis would be that we had societies from the start um the there's a view put out by benedict anderson uh he's a political scientist uh, now deceased uh, a book called Imagine Communities, and he proposed that nations were an artifact of modern media, that people uh, thought of themselves as the Portuguese or American because the media kept portraying these groups. And, uh, um, well, that certainly helps in the case of modern nations, but these imagined communities have always been there. Hunter-gatherers, who had a name for this tribe that extended over this huge area of these people dispersed, uh, had this imagined community in their head of the people that talked, walked, and so forth like them. It's always in our head. It's in the heads of chimpanzees. It's in the heads of ants. That you know, These are always imagined communities. They've transformed over time, but they've always been there. And so that's that's my perspective on it. And to see this continuity gives us a lot more interesting possibilities for historians to consider and anthropologists. Mm -hmm. So just one last question, and I'm not sure if this is just rephrasing my last uh, my previous question a little bit or not. But are societies necessary? Are societies necessary? Well, I'd say societies are as essential to human life as love, marriage, bereavement, all the basics. In fact, even more necessary because we only came up with love and marriage in recent times. Chimpanzees and bonobos are, are sibling species or are, are, don't have these things, but they had societies. And so our categorization of others in the world into these groups seems to have been eternally part of our way, our perspective on life. And it's given our lives meaning and uh, some of the best things that we have, some of the most nasty things that we have, we can get away from seeing others as evil or bad, but some of the best things that we have, we're not gonna lose those. These aren't gonna disappear. Uh, unless uh, someone can come in uh, and a uh, brain surgeon and remove part of our brain, I don't know what part it would be, we're gonna always want to have these groups and so there's this idea of cosmopolitanism that we will have one giant humanity well maybe we'll get a little bit of a sense of that but we're still going to want to have these societies we're still going to have those olympics where we can be portuguese or american and and root for our guys and gals Sure. So uh, the book is again, The Human Swarm, How Our Societies Arise, Thrive and Fall. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. Uh, Dr. Moffat, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find you or your work? Well, I have a, 
uh, and a website, Dr. Bugs, doctor spelled out. I am known for my work on ants and other species. So I am having uh, a great deal of pleasure connecting with psychologists and anthropologists and all these kinds of questions. So I, I address some of them there. And so please uh, do take a look. Okay, great. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Ricardo, you're awesome. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. Please also consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description of the interview. The show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters Karen Litzke and Blanchett Perugo Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Bernardo Seixas, Paulo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Robert Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslin Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, JW, João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, and Zachary Fish. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Kian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardis France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.